we live in a very victim mentality being very acceptable and it shouldn't be. Mm. That's number one. But number two is that people often will say things like, well, I don't like how you're talking to me. You need to stop. And they say that that's a boundary and it's not. That's just you sort of stating something that you like or don't like, or I feel uncomfortable when you speak to me that way, you know, please don't speak to me that way. That's not a boundary. That's just you saying how you feel. Welcome back to the Tool for This Shit podcast. I'm your host, Angie Sorensen. Thank you so much for tuning in. I can't wait to introduce this episode with you with my guest, Abby Metcalf, who you may remember her from 2022. She came on to talk about... Oh, let me just remember. I just <laughs> talked about this with her because I just recorded the episode. Um, yeah, the, interview, the episode was called stop keeping score with your partner it was number 87 came out in july 2022 and so today she came back and we talked about boundaries what they are how to make them how to hold them and followed by some real life examples of how to hold them when people are challenging you on it so we also ended up talking about aligning your subconscious mind with your conscious mind to manifest your desire so we went a bit off topics but i had to talk to her about it because she talks about a few things in her book and uh, that, that's one of those things. So I really wanted to uh, ask her something around that. So she's very, she was very, very cool. She talked about it and uh, she has so much energy and, you know, let's just, let's just get into the episode. Without further ado, help me give a big warm welcome to Abby. Let's begin. Welcome back, Abby. Thank you so much for making the time. Oh, I'm so happy to be back. It's been way too long. <laughs> no, honestly, I am really, really excited um, because when you first came to this podcast, your episode came out on the 18th of July, 2022, which is almost wow. a year, right? Because mm -hmm. today when we're recording- well, it's two years. No, two. 2022 yeah. or 2024. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you said three. <laughs> Yeah. No, two years. Yeah, yeah, we're in agreement. We're in agreement. Um, and that was number that was episode number eighty seven, and it was called "Stop Keeping Score with Your Partner." Mm -hmm. And there was so many good insights from it. I went over my notes uh, from back then, and I was just like, "Oh yeah, that was so good." And yes. so I know you were at the time you were writing your book. I don't know if it was finished already, but I remember you mentioned about your book uh, at <laughs> some point. Maybe it was shortly yeah. after when we were still in communication. I don't know, but I knew there was a book coming. Yeah. And it was about boundaries. I was like, well, we need to talk about this. So yes. that's all you're back here to talk about today is about boundaries, what they are, how to make them, hold them. And then we're going to do a little uh, quick round of like sort of like common examples, that, common things sure. that we come across that makes it really hard to keep them. Um, yep. Basically, you know, people and our own, uh, <laughs> our own saboteurs yes. inside. So Abby... Before we dive in, please reintroduce yourself, where you live and what you do. Sure. Uh, yeah, Abby Metcalf, and I'm a psychologist, uh, an author. That first book is an Amazon number one bestseller, Be Happily mm -hmm. Married Even If Your Partner Won't Do a Thing. And now we have Boundaries Made Easy. I'm a TEDx speaker, and I have my podcast, which is called Relationships Made Easy. And we're going to be entering our seventh season soon with in 180 countries, I think we are now. So it's really exciting. And uh, and I do have a small private practice, but that my main thing is the rest of this. And uh, yeah, I'm from New York City here in the United States, but live in the Bay Area of California now, which is outside San Francisco. And although I'm a New Yorker through and through, and um, I, yeah, that's sort of where I'm at now. I've got, you know, two kids both leaving for college in a few days and it's, uh, so I'm having empty nest issues, but other than that, very yeah. happy. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Grieving Jewish mother. Um, other yeah. than that, I'm good. <laughs> yes. You've come such a long way, Abby. Like you've come such yeah. a long way. I know we're not, we're not going to go into detail of this now, but, um, if like, you know, if, if you heard, 
the last episode um that i did with abby um she's de- you've definitely come a long way you definitely yeah. talk the talk um say walk the walk oh jesus yes. walk the walk yes <laughs> and uh yeah so i'm i'm definitely you know and very impressed by you and so Thank you. yeah no and, and so my first question to you is why are we bothering about boundaries like why, why are you bothered about boundaries why are you even writing a book about it yeah so i wrote this book basically because Every client I have, to a person, I'm not even making this up. And this is the reason I keep seeing clients, because it really keeps me in the mix of what's real and not just sitting in a tower somewhere doing a podcast. Um, And everyone would ask me a question like, how do I have more peace in my life? How do I have better communication with my spouse? Uh, How do I avoid burnout at work? How do I, every question they asked, the answer was have better boundaries or Mm -hmm. have boundaries. And I realized, and I literally had a client say to me once, you know, you always answer boundaries. You should write a book. And I thought, I I should write a book. Yeah. And so that's really what this was, is sort of the an opus of everything. And it really is the answer that everyone is seeking. If any unhappiness, any discontent you're having, resentments, overwhelm, it is truly, honestly, due to your lack of boundaries. And most people think they have boundaries and they don't. And that's, we'll get into that, but that's mm. the big mistake. I hear people say all the time, oh, that person trampled my boundaries. I'm like, you don't even have a boundary. You said you did, but you don't because you don't understand what boundaries are. So uh, I realized I had to really teach people what they were and then how to hold them. Well, actually, that was actually my next question. How do you define define a boundary? Well, at the end of the day, a boundary is in the big picture, it's you understanding that you are a hundred percent responsible for your thoughts, feelings, and actions, and that other people are a hundred percent responsible for their thoughts, feelings, and actions, no matter what you've said or done, or no matter what they've said or done. This is probably the biggest pushback I get from people, uh, because a lot of people, and I say with so much love, but we live in a very victim mentality being very acceptable and it shouldn't be. Mm. That's number one. But number two is that people often will say things like, well, I don't like how you're talking to me. You need to stop. And they say that that's a boundary and it's not. That's just you sort of stating something that you like or don't like. Or I feel uncomfortable when you speak to me that way. You know, please don't speak to me that way. That's not a boundary. That's just you saying how you feel. And Mm. that is probably the biggest mistake people make because you put the boundary in the other person's court. Instead of keeping it in your court, it is no one, and I mean no one's responsibility to hold your boundary except you. So a couple of things that from from what you said, like um, is that like I totally agree with you. We definitely live in a in a in a world now where being playing the victim card. Not not talking about being a victim. Like if you've been dragged behind, you know, um, you know, been dragged by a gang behind some, you know. Oh. I'm that's not talking about different. that at all. Of exactly. Not. We're not talking about right. that. That's like, that's an actual, like, you know, there's a victim there. But like, yes. we're talking about the everyday scenarios. People are playing the victim, you know, in this sort of manipulative yes. way, conscious or unconscious. And I think you're right. When we're definitely in that kind of society now. And I think that people don't like it when you, I say people, and I don't, I'm generalizing here, but I think sometimes we get pushback when we actually are yes. seeing people's power. I'm, like, I'm actually trying to empower you. I'm not trying mm-hmm. to to say, oh, I feel so sorry because I don't feel sorry for you. I know you, I know you can get through this. I know you yeah. can. I know you can do better. So I think that's that's a definitely like that's definitely an important point. The second question I wanted to ask you is based on what you just said. When you say to someone, "I don't like how you speak to me. Please stop doing that," you said that's not a boundary. That's saying how no. you feel. What would yep. a boundary be like in that scenario? Ah, yeah. So it a boundary has to have what I call like teeth. It has to have some response that you will carry out if the person does not respect. So an easy one to that is, and if you keep speaking to me that way, I'm going to hang up the phone, uh, leave the room, whatever. And then guess what? You have to do it because the other mistake people make is they say, you can't do that anymore. I'm going to leave the room. And the person goes, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'll stop talking that way. And then what happens? 10 minutes later, they do it again. And you go, hey, I told you I don't like that. You know, if you keep doing it, I'm going to leave the room like this threat. Mm-hmm. You, you have to just leave the room. 
you you have to say, you know what? I don't like how you're talking to me. And now again, if you've never laid the boundary before, you would say it once. And then if it happened again, you would, you would go. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if you've, if, but if you've laid the boundary before, you shouldn't repeat it. I always say never repeat a boundary, never repeat a boundary. If you've said it, I don't care how long ago it was. The person knows they're just ignoring it or they're testing. Mm-hmm. You have to leave. And the big thing though, is that you don't leave with an F you. You don't leave with a, you know, like, Something to oh, do on. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Right. You have bound. I always say boundaries are love. Boundaries are from your strength, from your confidence, from your clarity of who you are and how, wh- how you're okay in the world. Cause that's right. That's really what a boundary is. Don't cross the space or I can't be in the space with you. And then it's my responsibility to leave and I have to leave. I have to do the thing I said I would do. And that's where people almost universally fall down. That's where they almost universally say, well, I told them twice and they still didn't do it. So what am I supposed to do? And it's like, (laughs) you were supposed to do the thing you said you would do the first time. Mm -hmm. And so you have to make that clear to people. You can't just say, you know, I don't appreciate the way you're speaking to me. You know, you have to say, I don't allow people to speak to me that way. If you continue, I'm going to leave the conversation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and then you have to leave the conversation if, yeah. it, if it persists, even in a little <laughs> way, because people will test and you think, oh, they were just testing. I don't want to. And it's because people are so frigging conflict avoidant. And by the way, it doesn't have to be a conflict. You're not leaving in a big huff. You're not slamming doors. You're not smacking anyone. You're just saying, you know what? This isn't a uh, clearly this isn't a good day to have this conversation. We can try again another time. And you just hang up the phone or Mm -hmm. leave the room or go out of the zoom meeting or wherever you are. That's it. That's it. You don't have to leave with a big dramatic, you know, and I'm cutting you off and I'm never speaking to you again. And I'm unfollowing you and I'm blocking you. You know, all this stuff people do Mm. is where they get into trouble. Um, And so we don't have to go there. Yeah. I think when you have, yeah, no, you're right. I think when you have clear boundaries, you most likely don't need to do all of that protection thing where you like block people on social media, do this or do that. Or, I mean, I don't know, that's maybe, obviously there may be some, I don't know, there may be some nuances of course, but um, can can you, before we talk about why we struggle with them, because I think that's, that's very interesting um, from like what I read in your book, there's a lot of things that comes up. Yes. Then what is, before we go into that, like what's the difference between a boundary and putting up a wall? Because that's very blurry, I think for people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I always say a boundary is meant to keep people in and a wall is meant to keep people out. Mm. And when we are <laughs> dealing with, yeah. And so walls are from fear. It's because you don't believe you'll hold your boundary and you're so afraid of this person. And the fact that they don't seem to, you know, respect quote unquote, your boundary, right. Even though again, you're not holding it. It's really a vote of no confidence in yourself that you won't be able to hold that space. And so you block people. I talk about boundaries on a continuum from thin to thick. And what happens is our boundaries get too thin and thin is where we look, that's where we have enmeshment. That's where we have codependency. We have people pleasing. We, that's where I I worry so much about what you think. That is when our boundaries get too thin and we think we're being nice we, everyone thinks that like being nice means letting your boundary go. And that's not true, but that's what people think. So when, when I, when I do something with you and I allow myself to be taken advantage of, cause that's what you're doing, right? When I allow you to, to, you know, treat me poorly in some way, then what often happens for people is they then create a boundary that's too thick where they create too much distance, where they slam the door, right? Where, you know, I'm punishing my kid for the next year because they didn't they didn't do what I asked, right? Where you're blocking people, unfollowing them, I'm never speaking to you again, making these grand pronouncements. That's yeah. when a boundary gets too thick. That's like the punisher, the avoidance. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like it's not something that people want to be to pen yeah, like you know, most people not. don't want to punish you. They don't want to avoid you. They just that's how they're coping, right? I mean, I understand that. Yes. I understand both sides actually. But like, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. But yeah. that's where we think we're being mean to people. Like, mm. I, oh, that's so mean. Well, it does become kind of mean because you're so angry and you're so there. So the two sides, neither is healthy. 
you always want to have your boundaries. Your boundaries, and here's the key, should never change depending on how someone else is acting. Yeah. Or what someone else says. Mm. So when they get mad or if they're nice about it, it does, you know, that's what happens too, right? Someone's nice to us and we go, oh, all right, I'll do this this once. Mm. Oh, they were being so nice. So I, so I let it go, whatever the boundary was. And so, you know, your boundaries should stay the same no matter how nice they are. And certainly your boundaries should stay the same no matter how angry or pushing they are, right? Yeah. It shouldn't change. And But people change their boundaries all the time depending on how other people act. And then if you've ever been resentful, it's because you didn't keep a boundary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Resentment is all about you and not holding a boundary with someone else. Mm. That's what that's about. It's it's really, and again, I no, we are never speaking about if God forbid you were molested when you were seven, mm. that that, and you feel resentful about this person now. Of course you yeah. do. Like that's yeah. not that's work. That's different therapy work. I'm talking about the normal because you couldn't have a boundary at seven. You you that's not you know. We're talking about adults, you know. Yeah, let's say your boss calls you after hours and you pick up mm -hmm. every single time. Of course, they're yes. going to keep calling you after hours because yes. they keep picking up. They don't think it's an that's issue. On you. It's exactly. on you. Yeah, exactly. That's on you for yeah. not. And a lot of times I hear people say, well, I can't say anything to my boss. I'll get fired. I'm like, well, that's still on you because yeah. you either have to start doing your resume then and getting yourself a different job, which again, if you're always the cast as the victim, oh, I can't because of this. I can't because of that. Then there's something really wrong with how you're seeing your world. And I would want you to work on your empowerment. And I will tell you, boundaries are the best way to start feeling empowered. I will also tell you that in the 40 almost years I've been doing this, I can't remember someone telling me they got fired because they kept a boundary. You know what I have heard, though? People getting promoted because they had boundaries. <laughs> People feeling more better at work, more productive, doing more, I mean, it's, doing it, better. I mean, it's interesting that you say that because like, I never used to get fired for putting a boundary. But then actually in the, pan the, in the pandemic, I was doing these different jobs and actually I lost, a, I lost some jobs like a few in a row um, and each time they were speaking up and, mm -hmm. and it made me really shy to put a boundary. Well, that was my perception mm -hmm. anyway. It put me, made me really yeah. shy to put my boundary again. And then I got in this, this job now that I've been in in two and a half years or so and, and something came up where I was just like, the old me would not have let this slide. But because mm -hmm. I was so, I felt really, I felt like my confidence, like I wasn't confident anymore. I was worried to lose my job basically. Yeah. Um, and, but then I eventually took, took the courage. It took me a while though. It took me quite some mm -hmm. time, but then I did have the conversation and it actually went well. It went well because also the person was receptive. Um, I probably really thought about how I was going to phrase it this time, mm -hmm. but, um, so yeah, I mean, I have been in that situation where like it really did, I, I, I let myself be jilted by it and I hated it. I hated letting mm -hmm. myself feeling, you know, um, more insecure about it because, you know, I didn't want that to, to happen. Um, but I mean, to be completely honest, I think my perception anyway is that there's definitely some people that are not used to hearing no, they're not used to being a little bit challenged and mm -hmm. they, they, they have very strong reactions. <laughs> And so well, think, people can yeah. have very strong reactions, but yeah. it's again, number one, it's about how you say things to people. That's mm. a whole other topic. And yeah. so how you draw the boundaries, what you do with them. And of course, people have all kinds of strong reactions to no or something else. Although a lot of times you can say no without it sounding like a no. Mm. You know, you do have to get sometimes better at how you communicate standing up for it. Because again, most people see standing up for themselves as some sort of confrontation or a pushback or a, and I think there's a lot of ways to do that that are different mm. than that. That's number yeah. one. But number two, I really don't see that. It, it's not, I've had lots of people speak up and it's very rare that I've had someone, of course, maybe a boss gets mad or whatever, but they don't go so far as to fire. They they figure out another way to work with this person now. I, I think there are some exceptions, but let's let's go to. I don't I don't want to waste too much time on that. But yeah. I mean, I, I agree with what you said. But I'm just mm -hmm. saying that there's definitely some exceptions. Yeah, because for I was, sure. I was very very shocked by their reaction because it was not yeah. the reaction. That, this was not the reaction I normally get. Normally I get 
um, a back and forth conversation. We find mm -hmm. a resolution that works for both of us. We try something new, you know, something like that. Right. But sure. yeah. Um, and look, you ended up with a great job. So yeah, I would yeah, say yeah. That, that getting let go. Yeah, no, it was all good. It is was also good. <laughs> bringing you towards, and that's the thing for people to remember. It's having faith mm -hmm. that, you know, if you're in the wrong environment, that's the wrong environment. If you yeah. can't speak up. So, and there are environments where you can talk where it's, you know, it's embraced. Mm -hmm. So how do you get to that? Right. How do you shift your energy so you can get to that? Which is great. I'm glad you did. So the, the, I wanted to ask you about like your, your, your findings about all the different reasons why we struggle with finding out what it is that we need, what kind of boundary we need, <laughs> what it is, and then expressing it. Why is it, why is it a struggle? It's so hard. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of reasons. Yeah. One of it, the, really the biggest is socialization is, uh, first of all, I think women have a much harder time than men. I, when I'm having my conversations with men, it's often not an issue with their boundaries. Uh, I, it sometimes is. It, it's in different ways. I, sh I sh really should say that. They have different boundary issues. For women, it's much more the people pleasing and the much more of the going along to get along then men are socialized, especially here in the United States, although I have international clients. So, uh, but it, that's sometimes it, but definitely your family culture growing up. So if you saw your mother just saying yes to everything, you know, like always doing for the kids or always, and, and often giving up something from herself in, in lieu of the kids having something, then guess what? You're going to learn that that's how you show love. If you're a good mother, a good partner, a good whatever, a good worker, then this is the way you're supposed to act. And that you get socialized in. And a lot of us have never even, you know, growing up in my house, no one asked how I was feeling. You know, no one asked if I wanted to do something or if that was uncomfortable for me. You know, I, I grew up in a time when they were like, go hug your uncle or this strange man who just came in that, go give him a hug. You know, like yeah. I grew up in a house, you know, that's what you did. You didn't question adults or what they asked for or what they did, even if you were uncomfortable. So that's what I learned. I learned mm -hmm. to be a people pleaser and, you know, to smile even when I didn't feel like smiling. And, you know, if men were leering at me, I was supposed to take that as a compliment, you know, that kind of stuff mm -hmm. growing up. I didn't know wow. yeah. that I, there was another option. Yeah. And a lot of people listening, they feel that way. So we end up feeling guilty. We end up feeling, you know, it's our self-concept. Well, if I'm a good person, then I'm supposed to act this other way. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not, then I'm not a good person. Like a self-image thing. Very, very much. It's how mm -hmm. you see yourself in the world, your self-concept, your self-image. So, and by the way, when we push back on boundaries, someone will tell us that we're selfish or rude mm -hmm. or mean or something else, which is so funny because usually they're the ones being selfish. But, yes. But yes. they're telling us we are, right? Yeah. But, and you really, people really hate hearing that they're selfish. Some of that is also... Um, religious, depending on the religion you were raised, you know, there's nothing worse than being seen as selfish. You're not going to like in some religions, you're not going to go to heaven or wherever Valhalla or wherever that might be for you. And so if you're seen as selfish, you're, you know, you're supposed to be like of service. And so there's that, you know, and again, different cultures, you are supposed to give up your life for your parents that that is expected because that's what they did. You know what I mean? That mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different variables that come to play on holding boundaries. Um, you know, there really are. Is there also like uh, in your book, you mentioned fear of conflict and being disliked? Mm -hmm. That's huge. I mean, I it's just so big. Again, this conflict avoidance is so huge for most people because they see any disagreement as a conflict. And I try to tell people that doesn't have to be a conflict, right? Like speaking up in a meeting or saying, hey, I don't agree with that. There's ways to talk about things without it being a conflict. But we, there's, we've grown very conflict avoidant. I really think that a lot of social media has made us even more conflict avoidant. You know, the ways that we are, the remote work, all of this has really created, you know, it's a, it's a skill, to learn how to communicate with people in real time, in real life. And when you have all of these barriers now where you can, I mean, people say, I don't know, I get the meanest comments sometimes on social media or on my YouTube channel or somewhere. And I'm like, 
this person would never, ever in a million years say this to my face. Yeah. Not in a gazillion years. Yeah. People are really good at running their math on the keyboard. Yeah. Online. They're, just, yeah. they're just assholes. I'm sorry people are being mean to you. I just, yeah, I keep, oh, you know, you're not the first guest not. who tells, you're not the first yeah, guest yeah. who tells me Mr. that. Yeah, not. Mm. But, mm. but it happens. And mm. I'm just saying like, and even all the remote work, we've gotten, it's a skill to know how to read a room, how to gauge someone's reaction, how to really be present with someone. And we've lost so much of that. So this skill set is really being lost in a profound way. Do you mention the remote work making it challenging because we're not seeing the person? Like we can't, mm -hmm. and it's not like in real time, like I send an email, then you read it, then you send mm -hmm. a response. Like it's, it's like all a bit staccato. It's removed. Mm -hmm. It's it's staccato. It's removed. I'm not passing you in the hall, yeah. right? And there's no camaraderie to go along with it. There's no, and even when you know, I work with companies that do kind of the the fate, you know, like let's get together on a Friday on Zoom and everybody bring a drink <laughs> and a snack. Yeah. It's like, are you kidding me? You know, this is not it, and yeah. we're really losing so much of our social skills. Yeah. through and and we gain a lot right we do gain a lot i'm not anti you know social media or anti zoom but like you and i wouldn't be able to do what we're doing right now right mm, so mm. it's i think there's a lot of benefits also i see all my clients via zoom these days and there's a lot of people who would never have accessed therapy or coaching who now can access it mm, because yeah. you know they might be in another country but they also just might not be able to take off work during the day you know what I mean? Like, but now they can, now our schedules are more fluid. So there's definitely some positives. I'm not saying there's not, but we have lost quite a bit that yeah, we are not it, aware of yet. It's almost like we'd have to develop a new skill, how to do things like send communication, but remotely it's, it's all mm -hmm. a bit different. You, you mentioned also in your book about the attachment style could also be a reason why it's whole, it's hard for us to have boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I think it leads back to the, the, the wall you know, thick boundaries, if you were like an avoidant attachment, and then yes. the very thin enmeshment, if you're an anxious attachment, and then you obviously have the secure attachment, which is like the dream, um, yeah. which is like, who are these people? Uh, yeah. But yeah, that they exist. <laughs> <laughs> so true. And obviously these people could be a mixture of both, but it's interesting. I never thought of it within the attachment style. Yeah, it's, mm. I mean, I think it definitely is. I know that mm. Um, I definitely am a, an avoidant attachment style in my heart, you know, and mm -hmm. I've worked really hard to be secure, but it's, uh, so it's very easy to just, you know, not talk to people again, right. To just yeah. go, Oh, I'm just going to move along. I don't like how this person is acting. And I did that for, you know, some of my early decades, yeah. I would just never talk to someone again. And so, uh, you know, that's not, and here's why I often say to people, I don't like you cutting people off. It's because you're not practicing the skill of boundaries. Yeah. And I do believe, and I'm going to do a podcast in episode seven of season seven of this, but I believe all, there's an epidemic, at least here in the States, of this estrangement between adult children and their parents. Oh. It, it's like everywhere here, like where people have just cut off their parents. I don't like how you're talking to me. I've tried to talk to you. You don't, you, you won't listen. So I'm done with you. Mm. Like, and it's an epidemic, and I believe it's really from this unhealthy place of people not learning what ba healthy boundaries are, not learning how to maintain them. And you're going to keep attracting, because it's so easy to cut people off. I mean, that's the easiest thing you can do. Mm -hmm. And people will say to me, well, I tried for years with my mom or whoever. And I'm like, yeah, but you weren't <laughs> really setting boundaries. That's the problem. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like you yeah. weren't really doing it. And I'm not saying there aren't times when things are so toxic. You know, if your father molested you as a kid, I don't yeah. need you to have to work through that. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like yeah. I yeah. work through with a therapist, but you don't ever have to speak to that man again. I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah. But in most of the cases, that's not what's happened that I hear about. Yeah. And it's really people just getting fed up because again, they said, oh, I don't like how you're treating me, mom. And then, but then one day they just cut them off. Yeah, Because you know what I mean? But you have to work within that relationship to figure those things out. And I have done that work with many, many clients. I've done that work myself. I, I've talked a lot on my podcast. Mm. I, I had a true narcissistic mother, like the real thing, not 
not the yeah. way people throw it around. Uh, she was diagnosed, you know, narcissism personality disorder. And I, we had a very good relationship at the end, a very loving one. And I'm grateful for that. Yeah. So, but you know what I mean? Like, but I wanted to do the work because it was my mom, but I'll tell you the real reason I wanted to do the work. And I would say this to everybody who just cuts people off. If you have children, my kids were watching me. They were watching how I treated their grandmother. And I will tell you, I don't ever want to be in a position where my kids decide they don't like what I'm saying. So they decide to cut me off. Yeah. I don't, I don't want them to think that's an option. Also, and so that not, was part of it too. Yeah. And also I don't think it's because it is the hardest thing, isn't it? To not the yeah. hardest thing, but it's actually, it's actually very challenging to stand in front of someone really not liking what they're saying or how yeah. they think it could be anything from political views or how they treat people, how they treat you and so on and so forth. Right. But yep. the thing is, the reality is that if we were to really know every single person in our, you know, in our phone book, you would probably dislike most of what they, you know, what they're truly thinking. Like you don't, you don't mm -hmm. know everyone to the, the depth that you may know, others, you know, some people like your parents or your partner and stuff like that. And I think it's just, it's a bit of a cop out to, and I understand, you know, I understand that sometimes you do want to cut people off. I 100% really? get it. And there are some people that I have cut off. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that we have to be better at having those conversation. And like the yeah. thing with the boundary, I know like with me, like, you know, with, with family members, there has been like a situation where, you know, I've, we've agreed on some boundaries so that we could keep a good relationship. Because for yeah. me, the option of cutting, exactly. cutting them off is not an option. That would right. be the very, 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 very last resort. And it would eat me up inside. I know yeah. that. So um, that of, was not what my... I was looking for. And so I like right. what you said in your book. I totally understand the thing when you said about you choosing the conversations and you prepare the topics. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and one of my very favorite things to do that is so easy and works like a charm uh, it, when you don't like how a conversation's going or, you know, you're always like, for me, it's, I've shared, it's one of, one of my brothers, we don't share political views and we don't share vaccination views, science yeah. views, things like that. <laughs> and he's very much usually wants to try to convince me that I'm wrong and he's right. And so when he goes that, but it's my brother and I really want to have a relationship with him and his children and his wife, you know, I yeah. don't want to just cut him off. So every time, and he does it almost every conversation, he'll start to go there and I'll, I'll say, Rob, there, I love you so much. There are so many things I'm excited to talk to you about. This is not one of them. Yeah. And then I just change the topic very quickly. I'll say, so tell me how my niece is doing. Tell me how, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll or let me tell you about something my son did. You know, I'll just jump in with something else. And I have to tell you that sentence will change your life. Using it in a way that works for you. When you are in a conversation, you're at work and people start to go left. You can stop and go, hey, there's so much good stuff here. I get it but I'm here to talk about X and then jump into X. Mm -hmm. Like, don't wait, don't wait for consensus. Don't wait for everyone to agree. Don't, you know, just start going. Yeah. And that is a way you can keep your boundary, keep things flowing. And again, in a very positive way, like, wow, I was really excited to talk about this, or there's so many topics I would love to hear about. This isn't one of them, you know, and then go in. However you want to make that language your own, it'll change your life to start using that sentence. Can you, can you tell us about how to, how do we start by making boundaries for ourselves? So let's say, you know, a lot of us have not really, you know, most people, are, I think, I mean, let me rephrase this. <laughs> I think there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of us who could, who could, who could use some, some, you know, some advice on how to create a boundary. What, what kind of boundaries do you even want to set? Like, how do you even know what your boundaries are if you haven't actually practiced this in a long mm -hmm. time or ever? Yeah or ever. Well, so I want to say first, boundaries are not rules. So um, a rule in my house is like, pick up your towels, you know, if, if my yeah. kids, right, pick up, that's not a boundary. P people throw that word boundary around every single time they want something, right? <laughs> like, I want you to keep your room clean. That's a boundary, make your bed or none of that is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Those are 
rule. And the reason you're upset about them is because you think it's going against a, a boundary you have, which is what you really have to look at. I find that people make, when we're not getting what we need, we talk too much about what we want. And that's what gets in the way. Can you give so, an example? Yeah. Like my bound, you know, well, I'm not getting what I need for my partner, which is that I don't feel safe. I don't feel like he has my back. So when he leaves his socks on the floor, I complain about the socks on the floor. You treat me like a maid. You don't appreciate me. Yeah. That that's not, you're, you're so down the wrong pipe. I like you were wasting your time on something. So that's why creating boundaries is so important and understanding what you really need. So it's really, that's not the real issue. The real issue is that when you guys are in an argument, they start blaming you for, I don't know, you know, for their unhappiness or something. That's the issue. And like, you want to focus on the big stuff, not the little stuff. The little stuff will take care of itself because if you feel like your partner 100% has your back, loves you unconditionally, accepts you unconditionally, you would care less about that mother effing sock on the floor. Mm. You would just pick it up and keep moving. You would, you wouldn't have any attention to the sock, but you do because that other thing isn't being met. Do you know what I, and that's what you should be talking about. So how do you, how do you then express the boundary? Like we should, if you don't feel like they have your back, how do you even, how well, is so that, let's, how is that so let's get to that. Uh -huh. Yeah. So let's get to that. So yeah. when you're doing, and I talk about this in the book, you know, your first thing with boundaries is that you have to identify your, your deal breakers. What are the things you have to have? And I have all kinds of worksheets and stuff in the book, but what are the things you have to have? You have to have to feel safe, to feel honored, to feel cherished, to f whatever those words are for you. What are your deal breakers? And that might be that to feel safe, to feel cherished. Um, to feel accepted, to feel respected. I, I don't know what it is for you. Everyone has different ones. They're mm -hmm. they're all kind of nice, but there's really something. It's I always say when you've left a previous relationship, this is the thing that wasn't there. It's the reason you. It was a straw that broke the camel's back. Do you know what yeah. I mean? It was the yeah. thing that finally made you go. Or when you finally left a job, it was the reason that you finally left or started, you, you know, writing your resume or stood up to the boss or whatever. It was the, again, it's this thing. And you, and you have, and again, I, it's, it's hard to just do in a moment right now because it's such a deep thing, but you have to identify that from your deal breaker. You then understand your standards and your standards are things like, uh, has my back in all situations, um, thinks of me first before others. I don't know. Like it depends what you're talking about, what you care about. Um, and then you can have what your boundaries are. So, uh, so in other words, now, if that's my thing that you always have my back and we're in an argument and you start blaming me, mm -hmm. my boundary is going to be to say, I've been really clear that you have to always, we're a team and we are on the same team. And you are not allowed to blame me for your unhappiness. So I'm going to stop this conversation. And when you're ready to take responsibility, we'll have another talk. You know, when you're ready to to have it be an an us problem, not a you, not a me problem. I am I'm all in. So you, you know, just let me know. But right now, I'm going to leave. That's a boundary. Are there any exceptions to that? Like if you just told him that you cheated on him, he may have to blame you a little bit, <laughs> right? Uh, well, I guess, but you know, I, I mean, we're talking about kind of extremes, I think in that moment, like, I don't know if you're telling someone you cheated yeah. every day. So, so yeah, yeah. yeah, I guess there's extreme moments, but yeah. I'm talking general day to day. Yeah. And even then, by the way, if the whole conversation, and I've, I can't tell you how many couples I've met with, where there's infidelity, mm. when the whole conversation is about the infidelity, again, you're focused on the wrong thing. Yeah. Yeah. You're focused on the wrong thing. And you're like, well, when were you with them? And how many times? And what were they? Oh, my God. Such useless information for you. What instead you want to get to is the hurt and the betrayal. Mm -hmm. And how are you in a relationship with a person who would do that to you? Like, where did the relationship go astray? What 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 signs did you not see? Where have you not been paying attention? Where like what has happened? Because. I, when I did that, did do that digging with couples, I find that there were absolutely red flags before that, that there was a, a situation early in the relationship, not maybe of cheating, but where the person was blaming 
the their partner for their unhappiness in some way. So felt permission to go do other things. Do you know what I'm saying? Well, you were doing this. So I just went out with the guys, you know, you, you know, when you do this, then I do that. Like this blame thing, that's an early indication that there's a problem mm. that could turn into them hiding money from you, infidelity, or, or just not being on the same team. Right. And yeah. we take those things though. We, you know, as that again, blame game and all that, like if you work it back, there's a space to go, what is my response? Not, I'm not, it's not my fault that they cheated. Don't get, that's, don't get it twisted. No. But it is about what is my responsibility in this relationship? And and what's my responsibility in staying now? And you can stay and work through infidelity. I've seen it a million times. And sometimes couples are so much stronger because of it, mm. but yeah. you have to work through it. Yeah. What what happens is people say, oh, it'll never happen again. Okay, never mind. Let me try to forget it. And that doesn't really work. Yeah, because you have to just, there's always a reason. There's always yes. reason. There's, there's always, reason. always something going on. Yeah, there's exactly. always a place you can work it back to yeah. where if you had identified your boundaries earlier, what your standards are, here's my standards. Here's the things I can't live without. Here's the deal breakers. Then from there, and then again, the boundary then is taking a standard and having some sort of teeth, some sort of response. I don't say consequence because you're not punishing someone. You are having a response for when they don't hold it. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, so that's what a boundary is. It's identifying your deal breaker, having your standards identified, and then having some response for if the standard isn't met. Yeah. And that's, that's a boundary. Mm-mm. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah, it's not easy because you have to really sort of really understand. <laughs> yes. What it is that you're asking for. Right, because sometimes yeah. you just you're in the midst of everything and you feel a certain way, mm-hmm. but you may not know or really it's very difficult to put words on it, and it's because you haven't sort of really had some you know some thoughts around it, I think, like mm-hmm. you know sometimes you can go, "Oh, this really bugs me, but I don't know why, and so I can't <laughs> yeah express it. I, it and sometimes you feel like, oh, well, you don't want to be this like stringent and annoying person, you just want to be like easy going, but actually then it that 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 then that snowballs right and and people but that's the feel it. point mm-hmm. yeah that's the point of having boundaries that are too thin but then they get too thick because you keep going along to get along and then suddenly you're you know cutting people off yeah so it's it's that's the problem but yeah. so taking the time that's why i say all of the answers are about your boundaries yeah. if you've taken the time to sit and really think about what do i need you know identifying feelings is a skill yeah it's a skill and you have to practice it to get good at it to really identify what you need and that's why again i wrote a book you know to help people get from a to z because it's hard but the way I ask questions and the way I sort of have things written out helps, you know, I've been doing this for many years with people, you know, refining how to get there, uh, helps you get there, you know, helps you get to that place where you can identify, wow, this is the reason I felt uncomfortable at work in that situation. Oh, this is the reason I left that relationship with so-and-so. This is the reason I, I am having a hard time with my mom. Like, you'll realize it's the same thing in each situation. Mm. Because we all have like a certain trigger points. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Yeah. mm -hmm. So, you know, we don't go around, I guess, daily thinking about boundaries and what our, you know, what our needs are and what our standards are and how to express into a boundary. But you, you may have some sort of idea, but then you may come, you know, you can't control how other people are going to receive it. Right. So you may come across you know, different things. And that's going to make it really hard to keep your boundaries. You're thinking, oh, well, maybe, maybe I need to rethink, maybe I'm being too harsh, maybe whatever. So do you have any sort of like good advice on how to, let's say, for example, that they don't, if they, they won't take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. If you had set the boundary, like the way that you said it at the start of the interview, where you said, um, I don't appreciate, you know, you speaking to me this way. If you, if you did again, I'm just going to leave the room or, you know, uh, we can take this, we can continue this conversation at the time or, but let's say they, they push back on whatever. So they said you, you, you ask for something and a boundary and they, they won't take no for an answer. How right. do you, how do you yeah. deal with that? Well, that is the, 
you know, first off, you have to remember that even a new relationship, you are co-creating it in a moment. Yeah. You know, so you always have responsibility in it. But I, the big mistake, I think people start apologizing for a boundary or trying to justify their boundary. And that's why people are not taking no for an answer because Mm. you say no and then give 40 reasons why. And so what they do is they push back. Can you, and again, can you have an example I of think that? women, yeah, there's tons of them. You know, if you, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, someone, um, I think I even said this in the book, I can't remember, but one of my favorites was when I had a woman ask me at my kid's school to uh, come volunteer at this uh, auction thing. Mm-hmm. And I, I said, oh, I, you know, she said, oh, uh, can you come on Friday? We really need the help. And I said, oh, I can't. And she said, well, what are you doing? And I said, I can't, (laughs) you know, that's what people do. Well, what is it that you're doing? That's so much better than this. Well, if they're not nosy, they're pushing They're they're, Uh they want to know, they want a reason so they can refute it. Yeah. So if I had said to her, well, I'm, well, I have to work that, which I've made this mistake before. I've still told people while I'm working, they're like, well, all of us have to work. If we all had that attitude, you know, these things would never happen for the school. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, as yeah, soon yeah, as you yeah. give yeah. anything, yeah. I, I have a great one where I have a client who her mother so, asked her to come help on a Sunday. And she said, I can't, you know, I have the kids and, you know, all the, she was giving all the reasons why. And the mother was just knocking them down. She's like, oh, well, I have a place here for the kids to nap. And, oh, it's only Thursday. You could do all those other things you have to do before Sunday, right? No. People do that. So if you, ju- no is a complete sentence, right? Mm-hmm. If you just say no, you yeah. know, I, nope. I, 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 or I not even just, I can't, you can also say, I don't like, sometimes I'll say to people, oh yeah, I don't see clients, um, at night, which I don't, by the way, or I don't see clients on Monday or Mondays or, you know, and they'll say, oh, uh, all right. And I find that if I say I can't, they're looking for a way that I could, Mm -hmm. when I say I don't like, I don't do that. I find much less pushback, but Mm -hmm. either way, the real key is to not give reasons why. And if they ask you like, well, what do you mean? You know, well, wh- wh- why can't you do it? You say, like I said, the answer is no, you know, and that's it. And what I found is that sometimes people will get like, well, if everyone had that, res- you know, if everyone had that attitude, then nothing would get done around here. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and then I shut up. Like, yeah. I guess. Yeah. All right. Like, why yeah. am I going to fight them? Yeah, yeah. I just sort of nod my head sometimes and don't yeah. even say anything. Do you know, I think they say that because they themselves resent having to do what they're exactly. doing. They themselves did not hold their own boundaries. Yes. And yeah. so now their yeah. core boundaries, they're pushing you. It's like, because yeah. they'll say things like that. Well, I have to work too. And I have this thing too. I'm like, well, that's, you know, in my head, I'm like, yeah. well, that's on you for having poor boundaries. I don't. Yeah. So I, you know what I mean? And, or I might say to somebody uh, who maybe asks for money, you know, we'll get something like that. And I'll mm-hmm. say, you know what? I, we plan all our giving at the end of the year. If you want to circle back and send me an email in November, I'm happy to look at it. Yeah. Oh, well, well, I'll send you the email now. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm not going to look at it now. Like then it'll get lost just so you know. Like I'm always pushing it back on them. It's not yeah. my job to remember to put your email somewhere. So I call you yeah. back and then you get mad at me when I don't like, no, thank you. So, but all these things, if you just say no, yeah, no. For, again, it's with love. It's not with yeah. Matt. It's not, it's not a hard no. There's a, there's a wonderful author, Gay Hendricks, who talks about the difference between like a hard no is defensive when you tell people it's a hard no, you know, yeah, yeah. it's very defensive. It means you're afraid of holding your boundary. Uh-huh. He talks about an enlightened no, and I call it an aligned no, where it's in, I understand my, in my alignment that this is not a healthy thing for me to do. I don't have time on Friday. I'm working. I've got things going on, right? Yeah. When I understand that it's aligned. So the no is easy. The no is from that place of my inner knowing. And it's it's a simple thing. It's not hard. It's not F you. It's not, how, you know, some of us, right, are pissed they even ask. We get so mad. How could you believe it? She asked me twice if I would do this thing. And it's like, <laughs> she's allowed to ask all she wants. It's okay. It's all right. That's She's just asking. You don't have to get defensive. Mm-hmm. You can just say no. Yeah. And you know what? You know what? I can't do that. But, you know, I hope everything goes well. I got to go and yeah. go. Mm -hmm. But people stick around, they give too much information, and then they're upset when it gets used against them. 
Yeah. 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 Oh, I love this. this is so interesting. I love this. That's why I'm so quiet. I was, like, I was, I was taking it all in. Like, it's funny when you do the impression of the other people as well, because like, I think everyone, I mean, I can definitely relate. I was like, yep. oh my God. Yeah. Yep. I've, you know, I've been there. Um, yep. So it, say it, the words again as a mantra is what I always say. Like yes. whatever you said, you know, no, I'm, I can't on Friday. And they'll say, well, what do you mean? What did I, no, I, I really can't, can't come I Friday. Can't. Yeah. Yep. Can't. Don't try to, because people think again, right? They go, oh, maybe if I said it this way, maybe if I said it that way, don't, do not, mm. you're going to open No, it was clear, it was clear the open. first time around. And actually, yep. you know, the thing is, like, this is that, but that's like the jackass in my head that's speaking right now. Mm -hmm. It's like, if someone like, like, I would be really tempted to say, well, I'm just going to be velcroed up to a wall in the sex dungeon. I'm like, and it was just so <laughs> not true. But it's like, if you ask why, I may just give you a stupid answer as well. Like, you know, mm -hmm. like, but, you know, but then they'll say, well, can you not do that on a Saturday night? Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Screwed. Which, yeah, yeah. which by the way i've never been to sex dungeon or velcro to the wall but okay. it's just uh, it's always like i find always like a really good funny um funny right. little answer but is um mm, like what so can i ask you like why do we feel guilty for holding a boundary sometimes oh i you know it's... i think the whole thing that i said earlier with we think it's mean or selfish yeah. mm. Um, and again, we're so worried about other people liking us. Those are the big reasons. And I talk a lot about, you know, healthy selfishness. We know from the research that it's actually healthy to be more selfish. I don't want to get into all that right now, but we we know that it there's actually something, the opposite of that is called pathological altruism. And we know from the research that that is harmful, that mm -hmm. that pouch it's really like codependence on, you know, codependent behaviors, pathological altruism. It's actually from the research associated with vulnerable narcissism and selfish motivations. Mm -hmm. How do you like that for helping yeah. other people? Yeah. So it's really healthy when I say no and having yeah. some healthy selfishness, yeah. because even as a mom, as I say no to things, right, we can't fill a glass from an empty pitcher kind of talk, right? That as I am able to do that and I'm happier and clearer and, ha and more relaxed, my children are happier, clearer, and more relaxed. My husband is, my my friends. Like mm -hmm. I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna give around me as opposed to running yeah. around like a chicken with my head cut off. Yeah, and also it's like, it for me, I like it when people are very clear because I don't feel like I have to guess or, or mm -hmm. you know, walk on eggshells. Like you can feel yeah. when someone, you can feel when someone is not clear and they're just being overly polite and sometimes mm -hmm. it's cultural sometimes it's you know a trait that they have or some sort of insecurity that they have or, or whatnot and it feels really uncomfortable for me like yes because i can yes. feel it i'm like stop being nice i can tell you 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 that's not your intention you don't want right. to you don't want to say yes to all of this you don't want to mm -hmm. stop doing it it feels really uncomfortable yeah um so and I do want to say, and I don't tend oh, to be sorry. around. I don't tend to be around people like that for the long. No, it just it makes me so like it makes me so nervous inside. I can't. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my favorite tool for this is, you know, when you feel guilty when you're setting boundaries, is mm. to focus on empathy, not sympathy. When when we feel sympathy for someone, like let's say, you know, God forbid your your father died or something, you know, someone died. Yeah, yeah. When I feel sympathy, I go do things, right? I might cook dinners for you. I might come over. I might be calling every day. But empathy is not that. Empathy is having compassion and thoughtfulness about the other person without needing to do a thing. And so my trick for this is the secret is instead of thinking, so what can I do to make this better with this other person? You know, when you're drawing a boundary, mm. I want you to say, what can I think to make this better? Because we feel the way we think. We know that. So if I want to change how I'm feeling, which is this guilt, I need to think differently about the situation. So instead of doing, change your thinking. So, so are you saying that it's better to not go and do something for the grieving person or? Well, that's different. Like saying? when they're grieving, I, I'm saying that's sympathy. That's fine. Right. That's mm -hmm. kind of a, and you should still have some boundaries, obviously, but yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? And also they probably I'm also saying, want, they want, they want a bit of space as well. 
Yeah. I'm yeah. saying in general, when people mm. are asking for something and we say no, mm. we feel guilty, right? We feel okay. bad. Like, oh, I feel so bad. I'm saying in those situations, you have to change what you're thinking. So if you could, instead of doing for them, because that's what we do, right? Oh, okay. I'll come over on Sunday and I'll help set up. Okay. I'll, yeah. I'll come do the auction, even though I don't want to. Okay. I'll, we're doing. So don't do. So instead, change your thinking. So, you know, in your head, you have to remember, like you might have a mantra, like setting boundaries is kind and loving. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. good. Boundaries are love. Uh, setting setting boundaries helps people see the real me. Yeah. Right? And I, I'm more real in my relationships when I set boundaries. Setting boundaries is, uh, I'm setting boundaries, I'm not building walls. You know, you you have like a mantra in your head to shift that, thinking that you have, right? Yeah. Ba boundaries are healthy and don't need an explanation. I don't have to justify, right? Yeah. Like you do that, you think different instead of trying to go do something for this person. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Can I actually offer something on that? Yeah, of course. Mm, that this was a few years ago and it was someone who pointed this out to me in a Facebook group. And um, I thought that was so insightful and it really helped me. Um, there was something I shared in the group and um, and I can't remember what it was now, but it was about setting a boundary. I think it was in dating or relationships, something like that. And I had set a boundary by, I can't remember what it was, but it's, that's not how I phrased it in the post. I was just saying, you know, how I was feeling after X, Y, and Z had happened or had been said. And this person said, you just feeling you're feeling uneasy because you are, oh shit, what is it? So you're feeling, you're feeling this way because you just stood up for yourself in this new way. And that's why if, if it's like, it's unfamiliar and that's why mm -hmm. you're feeling this way, you just have to like hold, like wait it out. And it was something like that. And I thought that was mm -hmm. really interesting because it's true when it's like a new territory, it can feel mm -hmm. a little bit, it, it's a bit anxiety like that, you know, that you can feel because it's like, oh my God, like, now that's it, they're going to be mad or they're going to leave or something bad's going to happen in your head, right? So that's like, it goes into this, like, it, it could go that way. But actually, it's to, it was to remember to go, oh, actually, no, I just stood up for myself and that's okay. Whatever happens then is what mm -hmm. happens. But this new feeling that's just had to get used to, like, stretching that elastic band almost, I think. That's mm -hmm. what, that's kind of like sure. what she was saying. And I was like, oh, yeah. And it kind of helped me to, like, not overthink it anymore. And it's just like... Good. It, yeah, yeah. That's great. I think the question I get asked the most is, well, how do I say this so they don't get mad? Yeah. You know, how do I, and, and that can't be your question ever again. Mm. You cannot control, again, that's a boundary. You can't control other people's responses. You could say everything perfectly. You could have the best response that ever happened and someone could, you know, lose their mind. It is, that's about their reactions are a hundred percent about them, not you. But yeah. that's what people want. They want to be able to say things in a way that everybody loves and everybody's happy. And every it's not going to happen. Sometimes it will, but not a lot of the time, especially when you're first making boundaries because people aren't used to it. They want you to go back to the way you were. They yeah. liked when you did whatever they asked. They liked when they could call you at two in the morning to show up at four. You know, like they're, they're not going to give up on that so easily. And they're going to really be manipulative in their own way to get not consciously usually, it's not because they're evil, but it's because this is the status quo and the way they like things. Mm. So, you know, you, you have to keep that in mind. You you got to get away from trying to control someone else's response. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's like, like you say in your book, there's a lot of ways how, you know, the, the conversation of setting a boundary can sort of go wrong, well, go wrong, quote unquote, like their reaction, right? Like passive aggressive, mm -hmm. they, you know, it, it goes the conversation goes a completely different way very negative way um but i want to ask you about one of the things that you mentioned another thing that you mentioned is so you're setting a boundary but you're still feeling resentful why is that because <laughs> sometimes you've done all the things do you know what i mean like you've yeah. just you know done all the things but you're still holding on to sort of some old feelings about like these are resentment, right? Means to feel again, to feel something old. Mm -hmm. And it's a habit of thought. It's something that you've created over time that doesn't go away so easily. Is it because and of all the other times where you didn't set your boundary and yep. they 
trampled it, even though you didn't set it. So they didn't really yep. trample on anything. And so yep. now you set it, but you're still feeling resentful about the past. Is that what you, is that, is that what you said? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, so it's really just like this habit of thought, you know, it's a, yeah. a, a hat, a, really a belief you have about something is just a thought you've had over and over. But yeah. when we get into entrenched in feelings of resentment, it's actually, you know, these are neural pathways that have been laid down. So it's, it's really, uh, a, when you're clinging to resentment, it means you still feel out of control in some way. And so that, that's really the problem. So if you're feeling resentment still, usually it, it goes away. I will say that because you're empowered, you feel good, but I do have clients who come back and are still feeling resentful because they're still sort of tied in to the person's reaction. They haven't quite practiced enough loving detachment. You know, they haven't quite practiced enough, like really understanding that other people's responses are their own. Mm -hmm. And so they're still a little angry that this person, they're resentful that this person hasn't sort of, you know, come, come on board. Yeah. Okay, so this is basically, yeah, it's basically when they don't accept your boundary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, but, what it's, you do, but sometimes what you do... even, go ahead, sometimes even when they do, we're, we're mad about the past still. Yeah. You know, we're still hanging on. Again, it's a habit of thought. If someone really does not want to accept your boundary, I mean, in my book, it's like, there's no other way but just to, to walk away. Like, if they, you know, I mean, I guess it depends what the boundary is, maybe. And like, if it's a marriage or if it's, it's someone at work, I mean, those two things are very different, right? But uh, if someone doesn't accept a boundary, it makes it very difficult. Well, again, they might or might not. But if you're walking away in the moment or do whatever, what I find is that people come around because they're not sure what else to do. And, you know, <laughs> like one of the things I mentioned somewhere, I can't remember, but I had a, a client who needed she left a family gathering early because her brother had gone over a boundary she had set um which she had set very well so she just said hey this i guess this isn't going to work this time i'm going to go we'll try again next holiday when we're all together it's kind of what she did she did a great job amazing job and what happened was when she left her parents were mad at her initially but she was like very cool about it she goes yeah you know my brother you know, Jack, whatever the brother's name was, you know, he, we, we just had a thing. He couldn't respect it, which I understood. You know, I had to go and the parents got on him <laughs> and, and, and intervened and said, you better watch yourself. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, and yeah. that's what starts to happen. Stuff like that happens where other people come on board. So this is a, her brother had never kept her boundary her whole life. She'd set, a, but again, they hadn't really been boundaries. Yeah. She had said, I don't like that. Don't do that, whatever, but had never walked away. She never actually, she had cut him off a few times. You know what I mean? She had done that all the way to the thick boundary thing. But of course she's going to see him again at the next family gathering. It's impossible to never speak to him again. Yeah. So she used to do that stuff as opposed to really having a healthy boundary, which was, you know, Hey, I asked you not to talk about my weight. You did. And of course, in the moment she said that and he goes, Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot how sensitive you are. Oof, right. Like, oof, yeah, oof. of course, yeah. of course. Yeah. And she was like, uh-huh. And she just didn't take it personally. She did such a good job. She was like, Oh my God, I saw him as such a, like kind of pathetic in that moment that this is the only place he felt he could have power over me. Yeah. Was to talk about this thing that I was very clear. She'd actually reminded him before, like, hey, I've been very clear about this. Here's what I'm expecting. And he was like, of course, of course. And then he did it. Like she said yeah. within five minutes. And so, but she was ready to leave and she did. And she left with her head held high. She left without a big scene. She left without yelling and screaming. She said she was able to leave without like hating him. You know, she was annoyed, but she wasn't like overcome. Yeah. And sure enough, guess what happened when that was Memorial Day when they got together on Ju July 4th, which is a big holiday here in the States, you know, he was okay. He <laughs> didn't say a word. He was very like weird around her. She said like very kind of stilted because he was so afraid. She was laughing like, oh my God, he's having mm. such a hard time biting his tongue, but it was fine. That's, for, that's actually a great example of how to hold a boundary. Yeah. That's how you yeah. do it. So this yeah. idea that people never hold your boundaries, again, like with my mom, I was very clear when she would say things. I'm like, hey, I'm going to hang up now. This isn't going well. You know, I've talked to you about this before. Hopefully we'll have a better conversation next time. And I would hang up. I wouldn't wait for her to respond. I wouldn't wait for her to say, oh, I'm sorry. I just would hang up. And then we would try again. Mm. 
And you know what? Most of the time she's able to keep it. But every now and then she, she got better and better at not saying the inappropriate things, but she was never perfect at it. But what started to happen was, again, but every single time, it didn't matter if it had been months since she did it, I would immediately hang up or stop the conversation or walk out of the room. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, yeah. and in a loving way. And people don't know what to do with the love, by the way. They love it if you're mad at them because then they can be mad at you. Oh, yeah, because then, then, they, then they actually won. Yes. Because you had the head of reaction. Not, yes. Mm -hmm. But if you're not angry, if you're like, you know, I love you so much and these conversations make me not love you. Like it, it, it makes it really hard to, to feel the love. Yeah. So I'm going to leave. When you say that to someone, they don't know what to do. Yeah. They are so like, and then you just literally walk out before they can say anything. Like get the hell out of there at that point or hang up the phone or stop the conversation. You know, the problem is people sort of hang out, wait for the response. And what are you going to say now? And I'm ready. For stop. Stop. Just yeah. do what you said you were going to do and be done with love. Go wash your face. Go for a walk. Go have an Oreo cookie. Whatever, whatever's going to help you yeah. feel a little better in the moment. And then come back. And that's what would happen with my mom. So we, again, we were able to not have a perfect relationship, but she wasn't trampling them all the time. She would push every now and then, or she'd forget herself because people aren't perfect. But I would then just hold it in the moment and stop the conversation. And then we'd come back. And by the way, when I would call again, or when we would talk again, I would not bring it up. I would not say, you know, something passive aggressive or mean, like, oh, are you ready to have a better conversation? You know? <laughs> I would just pick up and go, hey, how are you? I haven't talked to you in a while. I hope things are well. Yeah. Sometimes she would do something and be like, well, you hung up on me last time. And I said, I can stop the conversation again. If that's where you want to go, I'd rather talk about blah, blah, blah. And 100% of the time, I swear to God, she would want to talk about blah, blah, blah. Like, I, you know, I would just move it along. And if she yeah. couldn't, which was occasional... I would just say, oh, yeah, well, then today's not a good day. Let's try again another time. Love you. Bye. Done. Like, it doesn't have to be the other. Now, this took year. Don't get me wrong. It wasn't like we had, you know, two conversations and it was. But my investment in talking to my mother and having a relationship with her was very high for me. It's something I wanted to try to figure out. So my investment in it was high. But if you have someone who just doesn't matter, you know, some Bob from accounting at work mm. who you really don't have to talk to, I wouldn't put this much investment in. Oh, yeah, no, I agree. I think some people are just not, it's just not worth the yeah, time because you're not just not invested. Yeah. It's so right. when you say the thing about your mom, it's, it, I hear I, like, throughout the example of your client and then the example you mentioned now with your mom, like the, the thread for me sounds to be like it's consistency. Yes. Yeah. So yes. You have to be consistent. Can yes. I just ask? And this is not um, obviously, I, I, you know, you obviously had very good reasons and so on. But like, there, there'll be like a part of me. Let's say, if, let's say, like when she says, for example, or last time you hung up on me. In my mind, I would be, oh, I upset her. She wants to talk about it. Maybe let's talk about it. Oh no, no, no. I don't want to discuss or defend my boundary. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. She's upset, but that's her. She has to go deal with that. Yeah. Now she kept acting passive aggressively with me because of it. Mm. I would just keep pointing out the passive aggressive stuff. Yeah. Like, Hey, I don't like how you're talking to me right so now. So I guess when she's, when she does that, it's the equivalent of the neighbor or the person at school going, well, why can't you help yeah, with the right. bake sale? Exactly. Uh -huh, okay. It's like, it's your boundary. You expressed your boundary. There was a consequence. You left the conversation. You hung up. Yeah. And that's why she's then coming back with, okay, I understand now. I understand. Okay, yeah. 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 Or she doesn't and she'll mm -hmm. have to deal with her own stuff. But as long as yeah. I'm okay, I'm okay. And as long as you yeah. keep treating me well, the way I'm asking to be treated. But yeah. I think that's, yes, the biggest problem people make. They want to go back. Oh, we should talk about all our feelings about that. No, we shouldn't. Yeah. Because then you're justifying your back. What's going to happen on the other side? Play that conversation through. At some point, you're going to have to justify your boundary. Mm -hmm. And you should never justify your boundary. Do not give reasons why. If people ask, you'd say, it's what I like. What's the main boundary issue in 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 a marriage that people that you've seen? That, is there one? Mm -hmm. Is that like a common thread that, you, yeah. that you've seen? Well, I think the biggie is people, again, focusing on what they want instead of what they need. That's what I mm -hmm. see as the big thing. You know, you don't appreciate me, you know? And so they see, they, they then see that everywhere. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yes. that's what gets seen everywhere. 
Is it the and thing so, with, I, the, with the Raz that you explain in your book? Yes, oh, yes. yes. Uh-huh. So I talk about the, that's why I talk about kind of the subconscious and what's happening, but um, do you want me to explain that? Briefly yeah, now? I think, it's, yeah. I, I thought it was brilliant. It's, I, I would love yeah, to it's really this. important. Mm-hmm. So, so everyone has this part of their brain called your reticular activating system or your RAS for short. And your RAS is a filter between your conscious and your subconscious mind. And basically, whatever you think of consciously, your RAS sends that as an order or an instruction to your subconscious to look for that thing. And the easiest example I always give is if you've ever thought of buying a car, you all of a sudden see that car everywhere, right? Mm-hmm. Every time you're like, oh my God, they're, they're everywhere. You know, whatever <laughs> car, the color, everything, right? Is like yes. everywhere you see. Yeah. That's your RAS. You thought, oh, I like gray BMW series, whatever. And it sent it as an order to your subconscious to look for gray BMW series, whatever. That That's what happens. And that's why they suddenly show up everywhere. So if I think my husband doesn't appreciate me, my RAS will send that as an order to my subconscious to look for my partner not appreciating me. And I will see it everywhere. Oh, he didn't wipe the counters completely down. There was some jelly on it. He didn't, you know, or she didn't, you know, pick up my dry cleaning like I asked or whatever, right? Or not making the meal I like, or they didn't clean up well. You The sock on the floor, you will see it everywhere. And what's really the worst part of this is that the RAS because the brain is so economical, you know, the brain is so good at, at being sh- as streamlined as possible. The RAS will filter out anything that doesn't match this conscious thought. So when my partner is appreciative, when they say thank you, and they when they maybe take me out for, for dinner for no reason, when they, you know, do something and that random act of kindness for me, I don't see it. I'm yeah. like Teflon for that. I it, It's like slides right off. And I have those conversations with couples all the time. I will have a wife say to a husband, let's say, you don't appreciate me. And he'll be like, what are you talking about? We, <laughs> you know, yesterday was your birthday. This literally happened. I Two weeks ago, this happened. He was like, yesterday was your birthday. I planned. And he talked about all this stuff. He had spent months planning for her to have a special day. Yeah. And she's like, well, that's one day. Whoa. That's easy. That's my birthday. She literally was discounting all this stuff. And then he was like, well, there's other stuff. I say, thank you for dinner every night. I, I ask if you want to go out for dinner instead that you shouldn't have to cook. I did like, he was pointing out, he did, he had a bunch. And she was like, none of those count. And it's not because she's a horrible, mean person. I get this both ways. Men do it too. You know, I get this all the time. And anyone listening right now is thinking, oh gosh, I've had this conversation with my partner. <laughs> I've said, you don't appreciate me. And they've listed all the ways they've shown it. And I'd somehow have registered it. Yeah. Or I've been writing it off. And this is why. It, this is like a, how confirmation bias happens, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. You're proving yourself right all the time. And we think we're seeing the world as it is, but we're not. We're seeing the world as we think it is, as we yeah. believe it is. Mm-hmm. So we're skewed all the time. And that yeah. becomes part of the problem with boundaries. It's like, it's like the... It's like your eyes are, they're not a camera, they're a projector. <laughs> yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, you just filter it out. Is this, uh, it's because when I, when I read this in your book, this, this, this is how I made, I made an association with something else was that I wonder if that's why, it manif- you know, in the circle, when people talk about manifestation, mm-hmm. is that why they talk a lot about mindset? Because if you have, yep. they, when they say you have to believe it, to come yep. through and to me that never sort of ever like really resonated and i'm just and then i was just that reading your book i was like ah is, i was just like yeah is it because like if you say yes. if you have a desire you're trying to manifest it if you yep. have a desire but if you don't believe that that desire can come through for you right your ras will filter out the opportunities yep. presented yep. to you to get to that desire exactly yeah that's so interesting. your beliefs are before everything what people think happens they think oh, I see something, right? And so there's a truth out there Mm. that I react to and then I get certain outcomes and those outcomes make me believe things. But the truth is you have beliefs which turn up what you will see or not see and then what actions you take and then what outcomes you have, which of course will then match those beliefs because that's where they came from. How how do you... Uh, obviously, this is. I know this is not part of uh-huh. the, the topic, but how do you change a belief? 
Yeah. Well, that I have a whole thing in here and aligning, you know, aligning your subconscious. That's why I did a chapter on that. Mm-hmm. And it's so funny because I had been learning. I did Anthony Robbins uh, in 1985. I walked on hot coals with Anthony Robbins. Yeah. And that was this year that I was trying. I've done everything. I've done Esk and Life Spring, all the things back in the day when I was getting clean from heroin. I was trying to find a different way to live. And there was all this stuff, right? About that's Anthony Robbins stuff, you know, beliefs and what you believe and da da da. And I was like, well, what the hell? How do you change this? And what I loved was that later, you know, and I took a very spiritual route there. Yeah. But what I loved was when later in the like the 90s and the 2000s, when I learned the science, I thought, oh, this is actually backed by science. This isn't woo. This is, you could go woo, but this is science-based, this, this idea. And so when you align your conscious and your subconscious, that's really how you get there. And understanding the first, you know, step in that so much is just understanding it. But I do have this, you know, aligning your subconscious and conscious like worksheet that comes with the book Mm. uh, because it's, but there's, you know, so setting intention though, oops, sorry. Setting intention is a quick way to align your conscious and subconscious, right? So, you know, just setting intention every, every day, like my intention, you know, you put your feet on the floor every morning. The very first thing I do is I set an intention for how I want this next portion to go. It's my intention to be really mindful. It's my intention to, to really be present and loving with my kids. It's my intention to be fun. It's my, whatever it is. And we start putting that out there. And that's what starts to get picked up. Because as, if you recall from the book, the other piece of huge, enormous um, biology that's at play was the work of Tom of Timothy Wilson, which is that our conscious brains process information at a rate of 40 bits per second, while our subconscious processes information at a rate of 11 million bits per second. Yeah. Okay. I know. So your conscious is nothing. It's your subconscious that's doing all the work. And that's what people pick up on all the time. You know, the subconscious things that you're putting out and that's why different things present themselves. So when you align those, you know, there you go. You set intention, right? I'm going to be uh, patient and kind in all my interactions today. What happens is your brain starts to, will remind you to be on that point all day. When you make that a conscious thing, your brain will send that to your in, to your subconscious to look for those things, look for ways to be on point, look for ways to be mindful, look for ways to do those things. And the more you do it, the, the quicker it happens. Mm, yeah. I, this is so good. I, um, I actually, cause you know what you're saying about this, you also mentioned this is the last thing I'm, I'm going to bring up from, from the book. Sure. But there's something else that you said as well about how sometimes you can forget. So let's say you've set an intention because it's so new, you forget. Is it yes. also why like this they they do things in the manifestation where they say we do this affirmation for 21 days, for example, because it takes also time for you to remember that's an intention that you have, you know, but then right. also like for to embody it so that. At the beginning, it may feel weird because you're like, you're not used to set that kind of intention. You may not really believe it. You want it, but you don't believe it. And that's why you have to repeat it. And so repetition and, and putting it out there is sort of like a really great mix to make things happen and change. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. you know, the brain functions on recency and frequency. So the more recently you've done something and the more frequently you've done it, the brain gives it a higher value. This is why it's hard to break a bad habit. Because, you know, if you've been smoking every day all the time, right, that's yeah. frequent and recent. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. your brain holds that as something very important. Yeah. And this is also why you'll think, oh, I'm going to be mindful today. And and then you forget, you yes. know, a whole day goes by and you're like, oh, my God, I was <laughs> not being mindful. Be mindful. Yeah. <laughs> so my yeah. favorite thing to do is to set a reminder on your phone for three times a day to be mindful. Um, and when that when that little reminder goes off, you can... Um, you know, you, it's like, oh yeah, be mindful. Like, let me get in my moment. One of the things, uh, something got emailed to me recently from someone who, who's in my tribe, you know, who listens to me and I loved it. It was when you set the reminders on your phone, I didn't even know you could do this. You, with an iPhone, at least you can set the reminder to show up with a picture. Oh, I didn't know So that. I know. So <laughs> now I do. So yeah. now when I set reminders on my phone, I, and I, you can have a different picture. You can have a picture of yourself, you know, 
I don't know, uh, doing something fun, or you can have a picture of, of waterfalls or whatever it is that will help you be happier in the moment, or, you know, a picture of the word breathe or whatever, yeah. right? Whatever it is that you're looking to do. But I remember when I was going to do a TED talk, I created a picture of myself doing a TED talk. I, I slapped it together with Canva. I have no skill whatsoever. It's very rudimentary. But when, and I would have that, I had that picture, I'd open it every day with my journal and I would look at it. And I'll tell you, I got the TED talk within months. Yeah. I did it within nine months. And cause I, I want a third quarter and I did it. And the picture of me doing my TED talk that someone took of me doing it is almost identical to that picture. <gasps> wow. Yeah. It's, it's, I really should post that somewhere. I, yeah, I put it in my that's, letter that's one incredible. week, but it's incredible. Mm. They are the same picture. And other than the clothing I'm wearing, and uh, that's what's so amazing. Like we do, but again, it's because then I have this in my head all the time. I want to do it. I, I just wanted to do a TED talk. I felt like I had something to say. And so I started looking for opportunities and I start, and all of a sudden I heard about someone who helps people get TED talks. And then I heard about someone else, you know, you start talking and the opportunities start presenting themselves. And I just became, I remember I bought a shirt that I was going to wear at the TED talk. I was I, before I even had it, like yeah. I told people like this and I ended up not, but it's okay. You know what I mean? I started talking about, oh, I have a TED talk later this year. I, I just, and I did, I just started like acting as if and creating oh, were you, my brain. Were you saying that before you had the gig? Yeah. Oh, wow. See, yeah. I, I don't have, I, I don't have that kind of like, yeah. Like, and that's okay if so. you don't, but you could do the picture and see it every day and start yeah. to imagine yourself there. And again, what happens is that confirmation bias. Well, this is something I'm starting to believe. Even if you don't think you believe it, by the way, even if part of you is like, oh, this is BS, <laughs> you keep seeing it and seeing it, which is why it was important that I put a picture of myself doing a TED Talk on a stage. Yeah. Yeah, I put my logo behind me. Like, I, you know, I did this little thing. It's so funny. But it's kind of how you do that. If you want a relationship with someone, you have to start thinking about who is that person. And by the way, get rid of, you know, they're six feet tall or meters or whatever you have, you know, or they're yeah. this tall or they have this kind of job or they make this much money. Because I will tell you right now, nowhere on your deal breaker list is money or that other stuff. What's on that list is someone who has my back, no matter what, someone who I always feel has my best interests at heart, yeah. someone who's honest and has a lot of integrity. Do you know what makes, I mean? Yeah, it makes you feel so safe when you as make well. that other yes. Mm -hmm. So when you make that other list, you are diffusing what you want. Yeah. You, you, and and you're and you're gonna get presented with that instead of what you really want. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. because that's what's predominant. People think about looks first. They think about that stuff. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you, like, that's not what shows up. Yeah, no, exactly. You're, you're going to miss it. You, you want a good person. And that's not yep. that's not in the heights and stuff. Yeah, for sure. And, but we we lose sight of that. We yeah. lose sight of what we're really looking for because we don't even know. Yeah. We don't even know what we really need. So again, when you do like the worksheets and other stuff, you know, you start to really get or do your own therapy. What makes me feel safe? Where do I feel my best? How do I feel inspired? Where do I feel inspiration? Where, you know, who am I around? When I see, you know, my wonderful Gary's car in the driveway, when I get home, I feel happy. Oh, I feel, I'm like so happy he's there. Yeah. Like that is something I close that front door and I'm like, I exhale. That's so good. Like, how, how many years yeah. have it been? You guys been together? Uh, 12. Yeah. 12 now. Oh, um, nice. It's very nice. And yeah. so it's really like, how do you create, you know, this thing when I, and I am divorced, you know, my children's father, I'm very close to him and his wife. They're wonderful. We spend time together. I envision that I was like, we're going to have, we're still a family. Uh, we're bringing other people into this family. My children are going to feel even more love from all the parents around. I'm, and we're going to make this, ha I'm going to make this happen. Yeah. Like I'm going to make this happen. And that is really what it's about. And I kept looking for those opportunities. I kept creating that in these relationships. And now we're all really close. Yeah. You know, oh, like I love that for you. I love that for you. I, just, I think it's beautiful. Well, thank you. I love it mm. for me too. And I love yeah. it mostly for my, I love it for my kids. My yeah. kids really feel like there's four adults, even mm -hmm. Gary's ex-wife who I love. I'm, I was just texting her before we got on, you know, she loves my kids. Like I love her kids. Like we, yeah. there's a, you know what I mean? Like yeah. there's, 
there's a there's a really nice extended family there, but you have to have that in your head that you're going to create that. Yeah. If I had listened to everybody like, oh, it's going to be terrible and this is what happens, it's going to be arguments all the time, I, I then that's what I would have had, I'm sure. Mm. So I'm not saying it's easy for everybody. I'm not saying it's easy for me, but it, it's there are some situations if you're divorcing a really toxic narcissist, you know, obviously that's going to be much different. Thank God I wasn't. Yeah. But I will tell you that, that's very few and far between people, even though people throw that word around a lot. Yeah, they throw it around are, a lot, yeah. Yes, yeah. there's a ways to, you're co-creating all your relationships and mm -hmm. that's why you have responsibility. And all you can do is let go of whatever anyone else is doing, keep your own boundaries, be very clear on what you need and just stick to that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. No, we got off so topic. Sorry. No, but, yeah. no, this is brilliant. This is like golden, absolutely golden. <laughs> I, I really love, I mean, I just, that, I really enjoy that. This is, um, it's a very important reminder. It's very important to, to, to know that. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I think, and think even, of that with your, I'm sorry, I was going to say, think of that even with your boundaries, right? Yeah. If you're thinking, oh, my mother's never going to talk to me again if I have boundaries, then that's what's going to happen. Mm -mm. But if you think like, I am, you this person's got, I'm, my mom is going to have to be okay with me because I love her. Yeah. And if we had conversations where I kept saying, mom, I love you, damn it. We, we got to work through this. We're going to work through it. I, I need you to hear me, you know, and with like some humor and some lightness yeah. and just a force of will. My experience is that people calibrate to that. Yeah. And, you know, I, I really believe in like, um, you, you can really change a lot by, by you know with self-awareness and stuff i know there's been like yep. you know relationship with family that you know there was there was we really, they had really challenging times like in mm -hmm. um but somehow you know we come back to it and also like it's also me growing up if that makes sense yeah it's me growing up and, not, yeah. and understanding that i'm not a child anymore like this is i'm speaking to another adult don't look at them as family necessarily right um you have the love that family comes with but you, you are an adult now and they're, yes. they're an adult and it becomes, it, it, it becomes different. And, um, yep. yeah, definitely. I think you can definitely change most relationships around, or you can make it in a way that, that works for both of you. Right. So this, mm -hmm. I think, I think, uh, it's, it's sad when people give up too soon, you know, when there's something that's yeah. not, you know, I think if you related to a serial killer psychopath, I think I'd understand where you'd cut, you'd cut loose, you know, <laughs> you may not yeah. want to go and visit them in prison because it's such a shock. Mm -hmm. uh, those are, those are real stories out there. Some people have really yeah. like, you know, really difficult family members that yeah, I would call that difficult. <laughs> For of sure. course. So yeah. I think everything else should be fine mostly. So, so we've come to the end, Abby, and I just, it's just been so wonderful, but I do not want to let you go until I can ask you the last two questions I ask every single one of my guests. Mm -hmm. And I asked you last time too, I actually went back and noted down what you answered last. So I'm I'm wait, to I see, can't wait. Uh -oh. I'm interested to see what you say now. So the first one is what, sorry, <laughs> the first one is what life lesson do you wish you'd learn sooner? Oh, to not worry so much. Mm. That worrying is planning a negative future. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, do you know what? This is so interesting that you said that. Two things. One, that was not the answer you gave last time. Do you want to hear what, what did the I answer give? you gave? Yeah, of course you I said, do. You said to live slowly. Oh, I love to live slowly. Mm. Good for me. Yeah, it's good. And, uh, and then the second thing is that I like that you said that is because when we talk about what we were just saying earlier, um, about, you know, uh, think positive, it's like, let me say with the relationship, like if you had listened to everybody else, you'd probably have like the outcome that they said that you would, Yeah. but you blocked that out. And I, and I thought in my head, which is actually kind of what you said now is that it's also to ne not necessarily look at the past data mm -hmm. of our own life, like of, you know, and thinking the same is going to happen again. Right. Does that make sense? So let's say yeah. if there's a relationship pattern, you know, enjoying is to just actually, you can actually make better choices and you can, you have learned from it and you mm -hmm. will deal with things differently and you're not going to have that behavior or that reaction or, you know, yeah. um, if you take accountability for your, for yourself and be more self-aware. So, yeah. So, uh, the second question is, 
<laughs> what do you not put up with anymore? What do I not put up with anymore? Um, what do I not put? I kind of never put up with a lot of stuff. Uh, I, you know, I guess. Uh, what do I not put up with anymore? Um, people who come from fear. I, I don't hang around with them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm not having that. Or I don't allow the conversations to stay there. Yeah. 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 Uh, do you want to hear what you said last time? Yeah, of course I do. So you said, uh, not, not saying what my boundaries are. And it was a longer oh, answer, but it was about, yeah, like not speaking up, not saying what your boundaries are and then that's not great. holding them after. So mm -hmm. yes, yes. See, yeah. and look, I learned, I learned, <laughs> and now that's not even a thing anymore. I love it. I practice what I preach. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's perfect. So Abby, um, before you tell us where we can find you or work with you, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us that I may not have given you the opportunity to? Oh my gosh, no. I think we covered so much ground, which I love. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I'm so down. Uh, I think, you know, the only thing I want to say is, yeah, where to find me. And then there's a thing I do that's a little special, which is, so my website, abbymedcalf.com that I know you'll link to yes. it's with a D a D not a T. Um, so medcalf, not metcalf, uh, A B B Y M E D C A L F and dot com. And that's where you can find everything, you know, the podcast and the relationship tips and tools and the blog and all the things, uh, all my social media, all that. Um, and I have a big YouTube channel now and all that. Uh, and then I write a, uh, I have a weekly love letter that goes out, which is like inspiration for the week. It's a short letter. Um, people love this letter. I have a lot of people on that list. It's, I don't sell anything. There's nothing being sold. There's no trick to it. There's nothing weird. <laughs> it is literally <laughs> just something I've been doing it for years. Um, and it's, it's pretty huge because there's so much, I think, value for people. There's value for me when I write it. I love it. It's a great connection with my audience. Um, and you can just sign up on the website. There's a tab that says love letter and you'll be on the list. It comes out every Wednesday. Right now, I, I'm taking a break in between seasons. I sort of take a break every year to redo my juices because it takes me a long time to write each letter so that they're short but impactful. Yeah. Um, and it's just meant to help you think or feel differently or be it feel inspired or wonder in a new way. And, you know, anyone who likes my podcast or like today's episode will love the love letter. It's sort of how it, it is. A, it's a letter of love. Um, so yeah, I just want to throw that out there that that's there. If folks are, it's again, free, there's nothing weird attached. There's no, there's no funnel you'll go into. There, there's nothing else. It's just, there's, there's no, no upsell. upsell. There's no upsell. It's just me trying to help people each week. Um, feel, feel good. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. Abby. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure to have you back. It was and, a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Some really fun stories and some great takeaways and actionable. So great. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Abby. All right. And that's our episode. If you enjoyed it, please share it with a friend. It can be a screenshot that you text them, a link, the name of it, any of those will do. If you give a five-star rating and a review, that really, really helps the algorithm for it to be shared on all the different platforms. And just a little note, please be aware that this podcast is always free to listen to. Any platforms that want to charge you for it are doing so without my consent, okay? This is free. You can listen to it on Apple, Spotify, all of the other regular listening platforms that don't charge you. This is free. So don't let someone charge you to listen to my podcast. Until next time. Use in health inappropriately.